Connecticut and Massachusetts, Z&M Homes buys houses. Sell your property to the local guys. Needs repairs, updates, maybe foreclosure or inherited? No problem. We got gotcha. you. Google or add us on Facebook at Z-A-N-D-M-Homes.com. For most musicians, the idea of being in one successful band in a lifetime is more than they can possibly imagine. The idea of being in three of them is almost unheard of. Not entirely unheard of, but it doesn't happen very often. So what does it take to be that guy? The guy who finds himself in a situation where he finds different levels of success three times. I don't really know. I don't think anybody does, but it does take something. Again, though, the list of people who have had that kind of career is terribly small. Eric Clapton would be one of those guys. So would Ron Wood and Ronnie James Dio or Steve Winwood. Like I said, it's a pretty damn small group, and my guest today happens to be one of those guys. Today, I'm talking to singer, songwriter, and guitarist Wayne Hussey. Get a load of this. In 1983, Wayne Hussey joined the late Peter Burns as a member of Dead or Alive. Appearing on their debut album in 1984, the following year, he would leave the band, and just before they recorded their commercial breakthrough, 1985's You Spin Me Round Like a Record, a song that not only hit number one in England, it peaked at number 11 here in the U.S., a song in which Wayne enjoyed partial writing credit. After leaving Dead or Alive, Wayne found himself with Andrew Eldritch and joined the Sisters of Mercy, who, rightly or wrongly, are still considered to be one of, if not, the most influential band in goth rock. Wayne stayed with the band long enough to record their debut album, 1985's First and Last and Always. And while this is considered to be a classic Sisters of Mercy lineup, by the end of the year, Wayne Hussey, along with bass player Craig Adams, left the Sisters of Mercy after an aborted attempt to record a second album, at which point they formed their own band, The Mission. Now, here's where things get a little bit more interesting, because now Wayne Hussey was both the primary songwriter and the frontman of a band that would release 10 studio albums, 11 live albums, and more than 30 singles, half of which reached the British Top 40. This is a band that has literally sold millions of records around the world, and in 1988, they released their freaking brilliant eight-minute-long goth anthem, Tower of Strength, which is not only one of my favorite songs of the 80s, it was produced by John Paul Jones of Led Zeppelin. I freaking love that song. Wayne Hussey just released the second of a two-part memoir series, the first of which came out in 2019 entitled Salad Days, which takes you from his childhood to joining Dead or Alive until leaving the Sisters of Mercy. The new book, which is titled Heady Days, talks in detail about his years of the mission. It's a hell of a story and a really good read. Meanwhile, the band has just released a fantastic new live album called Live in Buenos Aires, and the mission is back on a tour this month. In fact, they'll be playing the Brighton Music Hall in Boston on October 11th, a tour that includes two other amazing bands, The Chameleons and Theater of Hate. This is my conversation with the great Wayne Hussey from The Mission on Baxi's Musical Podcast. How are you? I'm great. How are you? All right. Good. Yeah. All right. I uh, just finished reading uh, your first book, Salad Days. I literally just finished it about two hours ago. Uh, All right. And I loved it. I'm really looking forward to uh, to reading the, the second book, Heady Days. One of the things that, that I thought was really cool as I'm reading the book is I literally just finished interviewing uh, Nina and Tony a couple weeks ago. Oh, really? Oh, okay. How yeah. is she? She was she was great. We you know we talked about the the new uh, the re release of her Johnny Thunder's biography, and, I, and I'm going to be posting that in the next couple of weeks. But as I'm reading the book, I'm like, holy shit! I've I've talked to that lady. I feel like I like one yeah. one uh, degree of separation from Wayne Hussey. So I thought that was very very cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well you know, her, her daughter is Severina. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. She certainly seems to have a, a a certain muse, a certain a certain type when she uh, she writes <laughs> writes her books. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she always did though. When when I remember when I when I lived 
in Liverpool with her, I was a fresh faced young kid, really. I mean, you know, you know, I was um, unsullied by the world, shall we say, by at that point. <laughs> And, um, and Nina, Nina, yeah, Nina. I think, as I said in the in the book, she she kind of liked the junkie, yeah, the junkie, you know, uh, the, the the thin white boys that like to sit needles in their arms. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, Johnny Thunders well, and know, Peter Parrots uh, uh, certainly fit that yeah, bill. Her husband Chris was really uh, instrumental in, in in I don't know. I guess I would call him a mentor. Uh, it, sadly, died earlier this year. I've also uh, listened to the new live record, uh, live in Buenos Aires. You, you know, sometimes you know live albums can be hit or miss, but this one was just—it's glorious. It's so damn good. I love the new song, Grotesque. Tell me about a little bit about that that track. It's just—I think it's—it's it, it's a beautiful, beautiful song. Uh, well, thank you very much. Firstly, um, is and secondly, it's not that new. It's actually it was originally recorded uh, and and released on an album in two thousand and. Seven, I think, mm. uh, an album called God is a Bullet. It was the last track on that album. And Simon, who wasn't in the band at the time, actually um, did the guitar solo on it. So um, it, it, Simon knew that one. Uh, I mean, it's a song, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a vegetarian and um, it was my my song. My, my, it's my meat is murder, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, but... you know, I mean, it's 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 something that I, I feel passionate. I'm not I'm not one of those militants vegetarians. You know, you can, you can eat what you want. I got no problem with it. But uh, at the same time, it's my choice. It's certainly a strong statement. But beyond that, it just happens to also be attached to a really great, yeah. great song too. Yeah, I I mean the the, the studio version was was good. But the way we've been playing it live with the with this lineup has been it's been great. And um, when I heard that version in, from Buenos Aires, I just thought, you know what? But, but it, why don't we just put that out? You know, do a video and put it out as a single. And in the absence of any new material or any new recordings, you know, <laughs> put something live out. And as you say, I think I think that that album is actually a very very good live album. I'm not a big fan of the genre, to be honest with you. Yeah. And we've released a lot. We've released a lot of live albums over the years. So. <laughs> That's why I say so many of them are, are are hit and miss. Sometimes they sound great, sometimes they don't. But I mean, I'm listening to this one. I'm like, you, when I saw the mission, uh, and this would have been 1990. Uh, you guys played on my college campus uh, back in Milwaukee. Uh, yeah, I remember. There's a trio of trio of hanging the stage, wasn't there? Uh, yeah. And uh, a friend of mine had 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 booked the show, and I, I had already graduated, but you know had to come back because I, I really want to see the show. And I just remember being just completely transfixed and how great of a live band the the mission was at the time. And then to and then to listen to this new live album, it's like you guys haven't missed a step. It's every bit as 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 powerful uh, now as it had been then. Tell tell me about you guys as a a, a live act. That's not entirely easy to do to still be great live after so many years of doing it tell me a, a little bit about uh, about the band now well i mean if if i knew what the secret was then i'd bottle it and sell it you know but <laughs> I, I don't know i mean we, we enjoy it you know we 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 do um enjoy the shows i mean i think the touring can get grueling the actual the traveling and the rest of it the lifestyle but um the shows themselves we you know we we always I say we always, but we we mostly enjoy the shows. There's occasionally one that we don't, but uh, that, you know that's normal. Um, <laughs> I I I think we just we we enjoy playing together. I mean, it. I don't necessarily think it's the kind of music that any of us would listen to at home. But when we get together and we get in a room and we make that big noise together, it you know we think you know what this is not bad at all. We, we're pretty good at this luck. <laughs> And and um, I, I you know and I think uh, touch wood we we're still we've still got our health you know to a degree I mean I can still sing I haven't really lost um, much in the voice department and you know we can still play you know I mean I guess the energy might be a little bit different these days certainly I think the shows are more consistently good yeah. now as opposed to in, in, back then they could be absolutely amazing or absolutely atrocious you know i think you know part, this is our lifestyle you know yeah. <laughs> you know I, I mean i you know for instance i don't i don't drink 
um on tour anymore mm-hmm. you know that's thing recent i give given up drinking on tour and i feel better for it i've you know i'd like to i'd like to go on stage feeling uh in in good health and and, I, and that i can sing yeah there's a lot of your contemporaries that have lost that that ability that's for that's for sure but the 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 tour that you're going on now you know with the chameleons and and, and theater of hate i mean you you to me that's just mind blowing you couldn't put together a better bill if uh, if someone held a gun to your head i mean that that just sounds like an amazing lineup to me again thank you i'm i'm not sure it would be my um my choice of a great night out but uh, <laughs> but i um uh, you know i i think it's a good bill i like the chameleons and yeah. i like theater i like kirk you know I, and um yeah you know i think it's it'd be good value for money and we you know we we we're we all come from the same era i mean or actually both chameleons and um theater of hate are older than the mission not as bands you know they've been around longer than we have but uh yeah and you know i mean um it's a it's a good bill i think i think you, you'll get a bit a little bit of everything with that i mean we, we did, went out and played some shows with the cult in uh in the uk just about a month ago just just three shows and that that was good i mean the, the, you know the old cult or it's a crossover and this, the same could be said to, with the chameleons and with theatre of hate. There's a little bit of a crossover with the audiences, but you know each band has their own audience too. So you know with the cult, it was there's a crossover, but you know the cult are more rocky than we are. You mentioned about how you know this may not be the music that you would choose to to listen to on on your own. One of the things that you did in the book that I thought was really really cool is every chapter came with its own playlist of songs, and your selection of each chapter was like it was just so diverse in the music that you were choosing that it, that every the flip of every chapter I, I just I had to read well who who's coming up this you know in this chapter because they were I mean a great bunch of songs well I mean I tried to choose stuff that pertained to the book itself but sometimes you know certainly with Spotify they didn't always have some of the the songs that I was talking about. So, you know, I had to kind of choose something else, but I just, um, I just thought it, you know, you're reading the book about music. I thought, well, it's a little bit indulge myself here a little bit and put, you know, some of my favorite songs, you know, together as a playlist. I don't know. I just think, I just thought it was, it, it was a cool idea to, to have a playlist that pertained to the chapter. And if you, if you so wanted, you could have that playing in the background while you're reading. I wind up reading a lot of, autobiographies for this this podcast and and some of them are uh, you know really great to get through and some of them are really not great to get to but i found that the the way that you described your career and your and your life you know even from early on in your childhood and then to to meld that with the music that reminded you of periods within the story i i just thought it was a very unique idea and i almost wish more people would would uh, would treat their stories that way because I think you know a lot of people on their own have their own soundtrack to their lives and it was interesting to see what soundtrack you carried throughout your life. It's really right. interesting. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, well, you know, I'm a musician and and I, the reason I became a musician is because I love music. You know, I love you know I my favorite bands when I was growing up. I wanted to be in the Beatles. I wanted to be Mark Bolan. You know, I wanted <laughs> to be in Led Zeppelin. You know that so that's that's if you're writing about music then then the music is the reason i'm here that's the bottom line you're in a in a very small club of people (laughs) who uh who have uh who have gone through not just one successful band in your career but really three if you go back to dead or alive and the sisters of mercy and then and the mission and it could have been four had you you know accepted holly johnson's invitation to join frankie goes to hollywood but I mean, that kind of track record doesn't exist with very many people. It just doesn't happen. Uh, but it has happened to you. I mean, do you do you see that as being like just, you know, like just fortunate or just at the right place at the right time in, in, in those situations? Well, that's one and the same, really, isn't it? Yeah. Being fortunate at the place at the right time. But yeah, I mean, it's a definitely, a, 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 um, definitely a case of that to a degree. I mean... I am a good musician, but there are millions of good musicians that don't have the lucky breaks that I've had, you know, or the good fortune I've had. 
there's also a lot of musicians who are far more successful than me that are nowhere near as good as me. But <laughs> that's the way the cookie crumbles. That's um, true. I've, I've been very blessed, you know. I mean, I'm 65 now, and uh, just wood, I've still got my health. I'm still able to make music for a living, still go out with, with the lads and, you know, touring and making a big old noise and enjoying it. I think I was all, I, I, I said in the book, I think I, I, I always felt it was my destiny if you want to be a musician i would you know I, by hook or by crook that's what i was going to be you know so if uh, i'd been in dead or alive and we flopped i would have just moved on to the next band you know and I, you know i, I mean I, I got lucky but at the same time you, you have to make your own luck as well yeah i think i interviewed john robb a couple months ago you know he just uh, oh, wrote right he's a very good great great uh, great guy and he, you know he just released his book uh, Heart of Darkness, the history of goth. And, you know, there's a number of re reoccurring characters in the book. You're certainly one of them, but but one that, that really sticks out, and he's a big part of your story as well, is Pete Burns. And every time I've heard stories about Pete, he just sounds like this enormously interesting, charismatic, eccentric character. And not anything to do with, you know, what he was like later in life, but that those early years of Pete Burns existence are really fascinating tell me about him and and about playing with with dead or alive and those those early mutations of that band well when i first moved to liverpool which was uh, around christmas 77 new year 70 uh, 78 that, that period, i would go into into liverpool into the city center and then go to the the independent record store which was called probe which was just around the corner from a club called Eric's, which um, which was very instrumental in in a lot a lot of um, musicians' careers in the end. And um, Pete worked behind the counter in Probe, and he was he was always really quite scary and intimidating, you know, because because you know if you go in and ask for something in in and he's, what you want that shit for, you know, it's like, <laughs> and then you know, just kind of throw it, the record at you. And he had complete license to do that. I mean, the owner of the shop was like that himself, you know, right. so it was like running the gun. I always prayed that when I go in, went into Probe, and, you know, for a new record, I wouldn't, you know, it wasn't <laughs> going to be Pete. Itself. But, you know, I got to know him a, bit, a little bit without really knowing him. I, you know, got to, you know, when you, Pass in the street, you stop and say hello. How you doing? And you know, that kind of thing. And then um, he he formed Night Nightmares and Wax. I saw, I think I saw his first ever gig actually. And he was, you know, I mean, I I, I think I said this in the book. It, it, the only time I've ever witnessed, you know, an audience back off from the stage <laughs> when the band come on. When Pete was came, with Pete, I mean, he was he was a very very strong personality, very. Um, he take he, he took no messing, you know. He he wore, he he was a working piece of art in his in his own head, you know. So he would never leave the house, you know, with untidy hair or scruffy clothes or you know he he would be immaculate. And he walked through the the centre of Liverpool and all these scary lads going, look at the state of him, and and he would take no shit. Yeah, you know. I mean, I've seen I saw him batter young you know young lads, you know, give, giving him lip. You know, he'd have a good, real, real go at them. And Pete, he was a big, big bloke. You yeah. Know, he, he, I'm, you know, he was quite tall, but he was also quite stocky. And, you know, you wouldn't really want to mess with him physically. But he also had this really caustic wit, you know, and he took no prisoners. And um, <laughs> he could be very cutting. But if if you were on his team, he was amazing. He was amazing to have on your side. And he'd be very. He was very loyal, up to a point until until he decided he didn't want you around anymore, and then then you're ostracized. <laughs> and um, I, I, you know, he he was a huge character and with huge a huge voice, very 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 talented, which yeah. is I think is so often overlooked, you know, in 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 light of his later life, which is a shame because he he really was a talent. You go from a, a guy like that. And then you uh, you join Sisters of Mercy with with Andrew Eldritch, and I realize the two very very different people, and going from one situation to another with 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 volatile strong personalities, in in a way there's some 
similar parallels in, in those two situations. But your role in both bands as a guitarist and a, and a songwriter are both pivotal. But, I mean, you know, Andrew Eldritch is, is again, a, a, in, in many ways like, uh, like Pete Burns in the sense that he is a completely individualistic, controlling presence in whatever he does. As I'm reading the book about Andrew, and, and I've talked to other people within his orbit, for lack of a, a, of a better word, it just sounds like this is a very complicated guy. And I don't know if he's misunderstood or he's understood exactly for what he is. Having worked with him early in, in Sisters of Mercy, what's your assessment of him, uh, you know, after all these years? Well, I have no no knowledge really of what he's like these days. You know, I obviously hear stories like you, like anybody else. Um, I, I, you know, I I hear that he's this, he's still not particularly easy to work with, which is which is fine. You know, there are people that aren't, aren't particularly easy to work with. Um, when I was in the band with the sisters, it you know, it was when I joined the band. It was a band on the verge of splitting up already. You know, Gary Marks and Craig both not particularly happy with Eldridge. Eldridge had already adopted this persona. I I didn't really know Andrew any other way than being Andrew Eldridge, but obviously Craig and Gary Marks both knew Andrew before he became Eldridge when he was Andrew Taylor. Yeah. You know, and and the, the persona kind of blossomed and took over. And so, I mean, you know, again, I say this in the book, I think, where I, 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 there would be occasional little peaks at, Andrew Taylor, and you know my my impression of him was as a he is very intellectual, but he was a bit of a bit of a geeky nerd, you know. <laughs> but but then he adopted you know the Eldritch the name is you know and and the, the persona became, uh, uh, I, I think it, you know kind of overtook who he was. I have no idea what he's like these days. I haven't seen him for many many years. Um, I have to say that when I was in the Sisters, I thought we were the best band in the world. So uh, when we were, you know, we were doing something that was really different at the time. You know, we were a rock band with a drum machine and uh, I just thought we were great, you know, and I loved it. But it came at a price, you know, I mean, Andrew was difficult to work with, not very personable, um, which is fine. You know, we you, you've been in bands before and since where you don't always get on, you don't have to get on, you know, I'm, I know, you know, I know, I know people in bands that really don't like each other, but the only time they see each other is when they're on stage, but that, you know, that's right. what they do. And, and for them, the end justifies the means. But for me, but for me and Craig, I think we just got to the point where, you know what, this, this constant battle of wits with Andrew, it's just tiring. It's just, it's just making the music, as good as it was, first and last, in all ways, it it didn't really warrant all the shit that we had to go through to get to that point. And and and, and I think we just enough enough. Let's let's get a band together with a bunch of mates. You described it in the book in a really interesting way. You know, Andrew being you know largely absent in uh, for a good deal of it, but at the same time having the rest of you guys are you know you are, are rehearsing have a good time you know socially but then he's also assuming a great deal of control but on his own timetable i mean you would probably know more than i than me but it, it, that just seems like a very counterproductive way of of working together as a, as a unit when the guy who is singing and doing lyrics is not there and not participating but then all of a sudden assuming this this real you know controlling attitude as i'm reading it i'm going why did you stick around in it as long as you did? I would think that'd be an impossible way to work. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't that long, really. I mean, it was. You got to understand. When I jo joined the group, I just left Dead or Alive. I was. I was asked to join the Sisters, and it was like, great. I'm going to go out and talk with with Dead or Alive. I think I did six shows in two years with them. With the Sisters, were touring all the time. So it was like, yeah, great. I'm going to be in a guitar van. It's uh, you know, touring a lot. So it, it appealed to me. So when um you know when I joined the band it, it, okay the dynamic was a bit fucked up but um I've been in bands before where you know the dynamic was a little bit weird you know but you just get on with it you you're young and you're adaptable and you, you know in 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 the overall scheme of things it's the end result that really matters and uh, so um I joined the sisters and you know yeah it was fractured relationships were fractured it wasn't it was never a case of um all working together on music. I mean, basically, 
basically we would all work separately. I mean, Craig and I did a little bit together, but basically, you know, we all took Porch Studio home and wrote our own tunes. And then Andrew would, if he felt like doing so, he would write lyrics for them, vocal melodies, you know. But it would it was never a case of sitting down there with acoustic guitars and, you know, say, how about this chord? Or, you know, <laughs> it, didn't, it, was, it was never like that, the dynamic. And yeah, and you know, and I think when when the mission were the complete antithesis of, of that, really, of a reaction, you know, we wanted to be in a band with the people we liked, who wanted to tour. You know, I wasn't even sure about being a singer, to be honest. You know, I mean, it was just like, I just want to be in a band to tour, you know. So it was like, okay, well, need a singer. I'll have a go then. <laughs> <laughs> you you had a bunch of songs that you presented to to Andrew at, as you're trying to start working on a, a, the second Sisters of Mercy album, and he rejected all of them. And smartly, wisely, you took a bunch of those songs, and they became kind of like the backbone of that first album by The Mission. And uh, and some of them that were rejected were just great songs. And I'm glad you did it because, you know, to me, that was like, it had to be incredibly validating for you guys as the mission you and craig to put that band together and then have it you know be successful i mean just it just had to be having gone through that situation with uh with the sisters and then to go to this other project Mm -hmm. i mean that's that's that that had to be incredibly satisfying of course i mean you know i mean within three months of uh, craig and i leaving the sisters we were we had our new band we had a bunch of new new songs as you as you mentioned i'd written a bunch a whole bunch of new t- i mean 12 13 tunes i'd written with the idea that you know okay this could be for, you know with the second sisters but uh, you know andrew wanted to go somewhere different with the second record which is fair enough you know he wanted to go to be more kind of uh, electronic and more i don't know he just wanted to go somewhere different which was you know fine it, it was disappointing um, and in the end, it was just like, okay, I need to follow my own route here. But yeah, when, I mean, within three months, we were at, got the band together. We had a set of songs. We were out touring with the Colt. Mm-hmm. And you know, within the space of a, in a year, we were one of the biggest, well, probably biggest new band in Britain at that time. So 1986, I'm in my third year of college, and the uh, the first album by The Mission comes out. And uh, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm working at the, at the campus radio station. And the first song we play is, uh, is Wasteland. Now I went to a Catholic college. And so to hear it for the very first time was like a real punch. It was like a real punch in that face, that opening line, you know, I, I believe in God, but God no longer believes in me. And then to read about, you know, your upbringing as a Mormon, uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I keep, I was, I was, as I'm reading, I keep thinking about, well, that had to be even a much more powerful statement from, from someone growing up uh, in, in the way you did. Tell me about, uh, about that line. I, I know it's, it's been a favorite of uh, people like Iggy Pop has really uh, had showed appreciation for it, but that's a, it's an amazingly powerful statement to open up your first record. It was accidental. I mean, I, I, I um, I, I, what I do remember is I was in the in the studio and I was about to do a vocal. I can't, can't even remember what song it was for, but the the Tim, the, uh, the producer Tim Palmer was saying, "Just speak in the microphone. Let me, you know, get a level, get a sound." Then it's like you know. So I started singing, started saying stuff, and and that came out. And he's and uh, and it was like, "Hang on, Tim, you 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 ready to roll?" And it's like, "Yeah, okay. Let me just." But you know, repeat what I've just said because I want to put this on the album, and and so I did, and then it was like, you know, we just ended up putting out this first thing on the album, because because it wasn't a li- any in any of the lyrics, it was just something that came up with there and then in the studio. It was I don't know where it came from, it was just one of those things. <laughs> well, it's a hell of a way to start a record. That's that's, that's for damn sure. Yeah, it was all downhill from there. <laughs> <laughs> The uh, the forward of the book, Gary Newman you know, writes about something that I totally agreed with, and uh, he had mentioned that the song "Tower of Strength" off the Children album, you know, in his opinion, was just like a perfect record. And I know you guys are friends, and I know he's only going to say nice things about you for your for your book. But I remember feeling the very same way when I first heard it. In fact, I think I played it like 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 six times in a row because like one of those songs where I just didn't think eight minutes was going to be long enough. I just want to keep hearing it over and over again. 
And the 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 funny part about it is I remember a bunch of people saying, well, you know, that just sounds like like Led Zeppelin to me. And I thought, well, I would hope so with uh, with John Paul Jones producing it. To me, that's like one of the, the great songs of the 80s. When when people hear you guys play that now, is the reaction still as strong today as it had been back then? Because, I mean, it, to me, it's just yeah, it's just a perfect record. It's it's an it's it's our anthem. You know, it's the thing we, we it's the song we normally finish our shows with the end end the nights with. It's a, it's the moment of communion between us and the audience. You know, really it is it's that it's it's that that is the song for us, really that um as I say, yeah, it's the mo it's the mo it's the biggest moment of communion between us and the audience. I mean it's a song I wrote for the audience, you know. Well, and that sh- that shows up in the in the live from Buenos Aires album because as you're singing it, it's it's like you're you're letting the the audience you know carry m- much of the vocals, but it's like, man, that audience knows how to sing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, they did. I mean, you, I mean, the thing about the Buenos Aires audience is, and it's always been the way. It's, I mean, they are fanatical, and, and I don't, I don't, for one minute think it's you know specifically for us. I think they are fanatical. Yeah. About you know the bands they love. I mean, nowhere else in the world do we go on stage and start the show with Beyond the Pale, and they sing the guitar lines. They sing the guitar <laughs> lines. Nowhere else in the world does that happen, you know. And it's it's an amazing feeling when you go on and the audience are going la 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 la. la. And it's like fucking hell. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, the, the tower. Yeah, Tower Strength is um. Still a very powerful song for us. You uh, you talked about your respect for for bands like Led Zeppelin and and uh, you know meeting John Paul, meeting a uh, you know like Jimmy Page for the first time. That didn't go probably as well as you wanted to. But then to work with with John Paul Jones on that record, yeah, you know, had to be really thrilling because he did a good job on it. I thought. Yeah, I mean, I I think the best the best thing about that album is that we were really a band at that point, and John probably as as a result of all his experiences with Zeppelin. I mean, really, he, he banned the record label from coming down. He, you know, management, state, you know, we wouldn't, he wouldn't play them things until, you know, he was ready to play them. You know, and I think it it became really... Um, a, 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 we we kind of had a siege mentality that he nurtured and, and um, encouraged during the making of that record so that we were... We weren't being influenced by business considerations. You know, of course, we the managers, you know, would come down and say this and that. But um, the record label were banned after the first couple of weeks, you know, coming down. <laughs> and I think we ended up making, I mean, I've said it, it's a record we wanted to make at that point in time. We were, you know, we had, we'd had a very successful first album and we were the record label were looking to obviously go one step further with the next record some would argue it did some might argue it didn't um it doesn't really matter now but what it did do it for me i look back at that and i think that was our strongest time as a band we were the closest mm-hmm. as we as ever we ever were and we were you know in a studio working with one of our musical heroes um for i don't know three months four months however long it took it was a while you know, and uh, it was a, a look. Looking back, it was a wow, a wow moment. Yeah, you talked a little bit in the book that, it, uh, and it was kind of like on, on the on the business end of of music. There was a whole discussion about like songwriting royalties, for example, yeah, how important it is to kind of have those discussions if you're going to record how you want to divvy those up. Because it is the kind of thing that tends to destroy bands because, you know, there's resentments and there's hostilities and some people think they're, they're, they're giving away too much or, you know, not getting enough or whatever it may be. You know, as a guy who's been doing this for an awful long period of time, does that philosophy of royalties remain consistent with you or does it change based upon the situation and the people that are involved? It, it changes, it changes with, um, the situation of people involved. I mean, when when I was in Dead or Alive, whoever came up with the basic tunes would get the credit, you know, even though the band would work them and evolve them, you know, whoever came up with the you know basic chord sequence would get the credit and Pete would get the credit for writing the lyrics and the vocal melody. With the sisters, it was exactly the same. It was, you know, uh, 
whoever came up with the basic tunes would would you know we would put as i said before we would demo and work on our own port studio demos and then you know give them around and andrew would sometimes deign to write lyrics for them and sometimes not and then you know that would they would publish would be split that way with the mission i wanted to create an atmosphere of being more of a band when we started um so what what i decided to do was give give everybody 20 percent. so basically usually publishing is split 50 50 for the music and 50 uh, 50 50 for the music and the lyrics right 50 percent right. each with the mission i came up with this idea of everybody music We'd split. It would be eighty percent. We'd all get twenty percent each, uh, regardless if we could come up with it. And now we get twenty percent extra for the writing the, lyri- the the lyrics and the vocal melodies. Although I came up with ninety five percent of the songs anyway, you know. But what that did do was yes, everybody, you know, it gave everybody a source of income that maybe they wouldn't necessarily have otherwise. I mean, they still, they still reap the benefits of that, you know, those, those splits are still there for the first three, three albums. And, um, what, what it did do was gave me the license to, um, say, okay, this is the put, this is the demo. This is how the bass line. I want the bass to be played like this. This is how it goes. This is I want the drums to do this. And I want the guitar to do this. this is how it goes, Simon. And, you know, and it, or I could go in with a couple of chords and say, look, you know, I've got this idea, but I don't know what to do with it. And so that way, then we would work on it together. And then, you know, and and everybody knew that was, they were getting a share. But I think once the band started splitting up and we were still going out and playing songs in, and uh, the, 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 basically Simon was sat at home, while we were on tour and and we were you know making money for him, over the course of the the the, the history of the band, publishing um, splits have changed, and now they, they they come back down to whoever wrote the song. Simple as that. Well, I mean, I would imagine that you know as time goes on and and people come and go within a band, it, it can't just stay like a static situation because. Well, I mean, well, you've got guys that may not have played with you for, you know, 15, 20 years still you know, getting you know, royalties on things that they may not have really participated in. And, you know, is that fair to the to the new guys or who are in the band? I mean, it's it to me, it seems like a really challengingly difficult balancing act, especially for a band that's been around for a while. You know, how do you go about you know, maintaining this without, you know, bruised egos and and resentments building? Well, I think with some, well, you know, I mean, when obviously when Simon left, we replaced him, but then you know the new kids. I mean, when we when when Simon left and then Craig left and we got a new band together, we still split the publishing, but the the publishing was the the, the splits were more. Uh, um, I think it was like ten percent. There were five of us in the band, so we each got 10% for the music, and then I would get 50% for writing. Because I'd write the songs, basically. you know. So then I would get 60%, and they would get 10%. I think that was the way it went. But, um, it, yeah, you're right. I mean, when when musicians, you know, they they did start to come and go with um, alarming frequency. <laughs> So it's like, so I, I you know I, I kind of didn't see the the merit of giving away credit where they didn't even play on a record. Right. So where are you at now as far as new music goes? When we started talking, you said that you know, in 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 lieu of a lot of uh, music uh, being ready now. I mean, do you have songs that are that are written? Or is there are there any plans to record a new album? Um, I'm always. I'm writing new music. I'm always making. I've got a studio here, so I always I'm, I'm I am making new music and uh, uh, all all the time. I'm actually working on a. I don't know what. I don't even know if it's going to be an album, but I'm working on some stuff which is um, more. How can I say more ambient? A lot of what I listen to these days is uh, ambient music, vocal, vocal not not without vocals, but vocals that are a component part of the whole as opposed to a vocal sitting on top of the song and being the predominant thing that you hear yeah so 
I like the idea of using a voice as another instrument within the, the overall context of the of the of the piece of music. I don't, you know, the, the the pieces of music that I'm working on are like 25 minutes long, 18 minutes long. You know, they're they are mainly improvised to start with, but mm-hmm. then we start building up the tracks. I I don't think it's it's not definitely not for the mission, but it's it's something I'm doing at the moment that I'm interested. In. I'm working on it with um with my wife actually. And she's doing quite a, uh, quite a lot of uh, the singing and um, the writing of words, but the the writing of words are more about sound rather than meaning. Yeah, and, um, you know, for me, it, it, it's always been the words need to sound good in music. They don't need they don't need to mean fuck all really, but you know, it's <laughs> nice what they do. But it, it's more important that they sound right, sound good to me. Um, in terms of the mission, I, I, I'm not going to say never ever, but uh, if we never do ever make another record, then I, I and I, I'm quite happy with another Fall from Grace as being the last one. I think it's a good album, but I'm just saying never say never. You know, I mean, as I said, when I get in a room with the boys and we have good old bash, it it feels good. You know, making making that old old racket. I mean, you know, I'm not averse to the idea. <laughs> but lo- the logistics of trying to get all that together is, 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 you know, we all live in different parts of the world. So yeah, it's, I was gonna, I was gonna say, you know, being in a band while you're in Brazil and they may be somewhere, somewhere well, else. I mean, like that, that can't make it things easy. Yeah, Craig lives in Maryland. Um, Alex lives in um, North Carolina, the drummer, and Simon lives in Sheffield, England. So yeah, it's, it's not. It's not, not we, we we don't get together every weekend for you know practice. <laughs> <laughs> we put it that way. <laughs> The mission is coming to our area, Brighton Music Hall in uh, in Boston on October 11th, and the live album is just sensational. And the uh, the second part of your book came out just this summer. Wayne, it's been a, a real pleasure to talk to you. I, I I wish you best of luck on the tour, and I can't wait to okay. I can't wait to dive into the uh, into the second book, Heady Days. I'm I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it, yeah, it's a good it's a good read. I think uh, it is. Um, I think it's a little darker than the first book, although you know it's got a lot of comedy moments too. <laughs> Wayne, best of luck. I I really appreciate the time today. Thank you very much. Take care. The mission is coming to the Bright Music Hall in Boston on October 11th with the Chameleons and Theater of Hate. The name of the new album is Live in Buenos Aires. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, feel free to like it, share it, review it, tell all your friends about it. You can find me on Instagram and Facebook and all over social media. And you can email me too at backtorock102.com. Thanks again to ZM Home Buyers for their support, and thanks to you for listening to Bagsy's musical podcast.